The year was 1961. And for the USSR, it was a monumental year because that was the year that they were able to send their very first astronaut into space. Well, they came back and they had this great big press conference and they're using it as an opportunity to tell about the experience, but also to kind of promote a little bit of the communist ideology. And one of the guys who was there, he was being interviewed uh, by some newspaper reporters and he begins to talk a little bit about their experience. And, and then he said these words, it was fascinating, Nikiti Khrushchev, he said, our men went up into space and there was no God there. In other words, hey, we've looked for him, but we don't believe in him. We, we actually went up into space. We didn't see any sign of the divine at all. And so, of course, this unleashed a flurry of you know, people responding to that. And C.S. Lewis, he actually wrote this article called The Seeing Eye. And you can go online, you can read this article. It's really fascinating. But he makes this intriguing point. He says, listen, if there's a God who made the world, the way that this God would create the, make the world and relate to us is not by a matter of spatial differences. He said, it's not like you have a guy on the first story who wants to visit with the guy on the second story. Well, in that case, all he has to do is climb up some stairs. But he said that really, that's not how God relates to us at all. He says, it's more like the way that Shakespeare would relate to Hamlet. Right? Shakespeare made Hamlet. He created Hamlet. He invented his world. If Hamlet wants to know more about Shakespeare, he's not going to find him by looking up in, in the rafters of the playhouse. Right? The only way that he will learn something about Shakespeare is if Shakespeare writes himself into the story. Right? If Shakespeare puts himself into the play, then he will have awareness of him. And he says, listen, if there's a God who created this world... The way that we will learn about him is if God chooses to write himself in the story. Now, I love that last line by, by Lewis because when you think about it, and really what we've learned is we've gone through the gospel of Mark, the gospel is all about God writing himself in the human story, right? It's Jesus coming and through his coming saying, this is what God is like, Right? It's a revelation of God's heart, God's character, God's nature, God's personality. N.T. Wright, he said this, if you want to know who God is, then look at Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be human, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what grief is, look at Jesus. And keep on looking until you're not just a spectator, but you're actually part of the drama, which has him as its central character. Jesus is the revelation of God. Now, let's take this a step further. Let's go deeper with this. What's so surprising to me is, okay, we begin with that foundation, Jesus being the revelation of God, but when Jesus came to earth, how did he come? Well, it's not in the way that you'd expect, right? Jesus didn't come with power. He didn't come with an army. He didn't come with NATO backing him, right? It was the opposite. When Jesus came to earth, he came in weakness, humility, poverty. Philippians 2 says he emptied himself out even to death, a death on a cross. So here's the paradox that lies at the heart of the Christian faith. And this is, by the way, what sets Christianity apart from other world religions. You have Jesus being the revelation of God, but Jesus, when he came to earth, he came in weakness and brokenness and humility. So what does that tell us about God? That's the paradox, that's the issue. And I would propose really two things. First of all, it tells us that God's ways aren't our ways, right? His kingdom is nothing like the kingdom of this world. But secondly, it tells me that if God has chosen to come in weakness, if he's chosen to save the world through the humiliation of the cross, then the kinds of people that will be drawn to this Jesus will be weak, broken, humbled, hurting people. In other words, if Jesus is the subversion of power, then the kinds of people who want to follow after this Jesus will be the powerless 
and the hurting and the grieving and the wounded. If Jesus is not who you expected him to be, then the kinds of people who wanna follow after Jesus may not be the kinds of people that you expect. We've learned in Mark that everything about this Jesus is counterintuitive. He takes all the things that we value and he turns it upside down and he says, this is how I'm going to build my movement. I'm gonna take the least likely people and I'm gonna use them in the least likely ways. That is the narrative of scripture, right? Genesis to Revelation, we see this happening over and over again. That's the story of our lives and that's the story of what we're gonna see today in Mark 15. So if you have your Bibles open, let's begin in verse 39. And we begin with the centurion. It says, when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. And women were watching from a distance. And among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Verse 42, and it was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. And so as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. And so Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. And he rolled the stone against the entrance of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. So Mark 15, uh, Jesus has now already died. We saw last week um, his final words on the cross were, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Um, we also learned that when Jesus died, a bunch of crazy stuff happened, right? The veil was torn in two. Darkness came over the land. It says there was even an earthquake. So it was this monumentous event. And you would think with all of these things happening, with the moment, the moment in which God dies for the world, that you would think around the cross would be hundreds, if not thousands, of followers of Jesus, right? People who loved him and were committed to him and wanted to serve him. You would expect there to be a worship gathering or people repenting and the disciples leading the charge in this. But instead, what Mark is describing in our story, well, that is not how it went down at all. Um, it was about 10 years ago when I was... Uh, uh, in Maui, and uh, as a pastor there, taking up my cross daily like you do in Maui. And uh, it was a Sunday morning, it was like 6.30 a.m., and there was a, a pretty large earthquake, I think it was around 7.1 or so, and it shook us all awake, and, and I'm wondering, okay, is anyone gonna show up at church? Because it knocked down power on the island, and you know, so I show up expecting it to be a ghost town. You would have thought it was Easter Sunday or something. The 8 a.m., the 10, like, packed with all of these people, standing room only. And so, you know, I, we had no mic, so I'm just, you know, talking, preaching, and abandoned the message I had, changed the message on the fly, gave a call of repentance and baptism. All these people are, like, coming to faith and baptized in the world's biggest uh, baptismal, the Pacific Ocean, right? It was just this incredible, epic moment, right? And that's kind of what I'm expecting in this story. I mean, here's an earthquake and torn veils and darkness and all this stuff happening, and I would expect that here, the beginning of the revolution, the foundation on which the church would be built, that the kinds of people who would be there would be the people like the disciples and the leaders, but that's not what we see. This is a narrative that tells us that the heroes of the story are the people that you would least expect, especially if you lived back then. You see, here's, here's one of the challenges that we face in the 21st century when we read the Bible. We read it through our lens, and because of that, we often fail 
to see and understand how they would have read it and how they would have seen it. And if you were in the first century church and you read this story, it would have been shocking and scandalous and confusing. It would have been a bombshell moment because what Mark is telling us is that the people who were there who witnessed the most important event ever, Jesus dying on the cross, were the least likely people imaginable. People like who? Well, if you're taking notes, I wanna share three, three that Mark gives us. Number one, we see a centurion. Look down again in verse 39. Um, He's there at the foot of the cross. He says, surely this man was the son of God. Now, um, you may wanna write down or highlight or underline that phrase, son of God, because in the first century, there was only one son of God. If you're under the Roman Empire, there's only one person who had that title. And who was that? It was Caesar, right? At this time, when Mark is writing, Caesar Nero was on the throne, which if you've done your history and you've read about this time, from all accounts, he really seemed to be kind of insane, right? He had some some issues, as they say in North Carolina. Uh, The wheel's turning, but the hamster's dead. Um, Like... (laughs) It seemed to be, like, you look at Nero, it's like, really? You're going to light Rome on fire? Okay. Uh, He would torture Christians. He was sadistic. He was cruel. And on top of that, he had a serious God complex. He called himself, in Latin, Divi Filius, which means son of God. To call someone else the son of God at that time, you are putting your life on the line especially if as a centurion, you're working for the system. At the very least, you could lose your job, you could be punished, your whole family could be executed. This was dangerous, subversive language, but check this out, the centurion didn't seem to care about that because there was something in the way that Jesus died that got his attention. Maybe it was his unconditional love, maybe it was his forgiveness, maybe it was his courage to the very end. Something about this Jesus, when the centurion looked at him, he was touched and changed and transformed, and he said, this man is the son of God. It's not Nero. It's not Caesar. He is Divi Filius. And what is so scandalous about this is the very first man to be ushered into the kingdom after Jesus' death, the very first man to proclaim Jesus as the son of God wasn't a religious person. It wasn't a churchgoer. It wasn't a Caleb listener. It was an enemy, right? A centurion, the other, the guy that if you're a good first century Jew, you hated, despised. You're looking for a way to bring down, what? He was the very first? This is unexpected to say the least, but it gets worse. Um, He describes another group of people. In verses 40 through 41, he says, women were there. Check it out. He says, there was a group of women who helped take care of Jesus' practical needs. They were at the cross. They saw what happened. They're witnesses to the event. Now, again, this is one of the situations where we read this and we think, so what? Women were there. Well, 50-50 chance, right? Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really seem to affect us. If you read this back then, this was huge. And here's why. They are witnesses to the death of Jesus. They would be called upon to give testimony to the death of Jesus. But in the first century, in Greco-Roman culture, women were seen in very, very, very low regard. They had virtually no rights. They're marginalized. They weren't allowed to own property. They were seen as the property of men. By law, men could sell their wives into slavery. The testimony of a woman meant nothing in the court of law. This is an oppressive, chauvinistic, sexist culture. We have a picture of a guy named Celsus. Um, If you've been to the Louvre in France, uh, you've seen this probably. Um, He was a second century philosopher in Rome. And very very interesting guy. Um, And one of the things he's kind of known for is his hatred of Christianity. Like, he despised Christians. Why? The number one reason he hated them is because Christianity gave rights to women. Christians dared to say such things as, in Jesus there's neither Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free, you're all one in Christ. And he's like, 
that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't fit our culture. In fact, in one of his books, he has this whole discourse and he's like, you know what? <laughs> we can't trust women, he says. He says women are unstable, they're neurotic, they're hysterical, you can't trust them. And he goes on this rant and then he makes this point. He says, and that's why we can't trust Christianity because Christianity is built on a foundation of women. They were the ones at the cross. They supposedly saw the resurrection and we all know, don't we, that we can't trust women. Therefore, you cannot trust Christianity. Now, his chauvinism aside, which is pretty dreadful, right? What's so interesting though about this is that if Mark is making all of this up, if Mark is like, you know what? I think I'm going to create a religion, right? Let, let's call it Christianity. It'll be about a guy named Jesus. Well, <laughs> you would never dream if you were inventing the whole thing of beginning of movement based on a foundation of the testimony of women. Like you never, ever, ever do that. Instead, what they would teach you, first century college, how to start a religion 101, they would say, you begin with a testimony of men. And, and so it should say something like this. Hey, there's a guy named Jesus who died on the cross. And the reason we know this is so, because we have witnesses, we have eyewitnesses who actually saw this event. They can tell you exactly what happened because they were there. It's a group of guys. You can go talk to them. You can get to know them. They will tell you that these things are true. That's how the story should go down. You would never, ever put women in the story in center stage, ever. So the only reason that they're here in this story is because, well, maybe they were actually there. <laughs> the only reason to account for them being depicted as witnesses is if they were witnesses. Mark is recording history. He's not manipulating, subverting the facts, trying to twist it in a way that fit politically with how they perceive the world. And Mark is recording a revolution. Mark is telling us that because of this crucified Jesus, that those who are on the outside are now brought into the inside. That the old stigmas and biases and sexism and prejudice, all of that has been torn down because of Jesus. Those who were sidelined are now given center stage. Those who have been oppressed are now elevated. The victim has become the child of God. Women have become the heroes of the story. Mark says, they were there. They saw what happened. They are part of this movement in which God is going to revolutionize and shape the world. Again, you're sitting in the first century, you're reading this, this was a bombshell. A centurion? Get out of here. What? Uh, the enemy? He was there? A group of women? What? They gave testimony that Jesus actually died on the cross, but then it actually gets even worse than all of that because the chapter ends and he talks about, well, a Pharisee. Check out verses 42 through 47. Mark introduces us to a guy named Joseph of Arimathea, or as they called him back then, J of A. And Mark describes, he says, he was a member of the council, if you're taking notes, you can just write down uh, the Sanhedrin, which was basically the Jewish Supreme Court. Uh, most Bible scholars do, in, th in fact, think that he was a Pharisee because of that position. And check this out. John 19.38 describes him as, quote, a secret disciple of Jesus. Secret disciple? Like, doesn't that sound like an oxymoron? <laughs> like, I read this this last week. I'm like, how is that even possible? Secret and disciple, like the two words really don't go together, right? It's like saying, I don't know, jumbo shrimp, right? Or bitter sweet or dodge ram or short sermon. Like some things just really don't <laughs> mesh well together. And yet, however that worked, he's incognito, right? And he's pretending that he doesn't believe, but he really does in his heart. John tells us that he was afraid of the Jewish leaders. So he's a coward, basically. He was probably there in the room when the Pharisees tried to sentence him to death, and yet he probably kept silent. He wasn't willing to come out and share his allegiance to Jesus. But again, like the centurion, something happened. He's at the cross. He sees Jesus, and his heart is changed. Verse 43, he boldly asked for Pilate, or from Pilate Jesus' body. Man, there's a courage. There's a steel 
to his spine, where before he could care less. Now he's like, hey, I want the body of Jesus, which that could have cost him his job. It could have cost him his life because Pilate had just executed Jesus. Therefore, anyone who followed Jesus was now an enemy of the state. But he didn't care about that. He's like, you know what? I'm willing to go on a rim. I'm willing to risk my life. I'm willing to stick out my neck and I want his body so I can bury it. Verse 46, he takes the body of Jesus and buries it in his tomb, which in the first century, if you had the money to afford your own tomb, it was for you and your family. Like you would never put a stranger in your burial plot. That's weird. But he's like, you know what? I don't care. Jesus is like family to me. I'm gonna give him the honor that he deserves. I'll, I'll, I'll bury him. Now for Joseph, he's understand, for him, this was a lifelong commitment. He was willing to live with the stigma. Put Jesus in my tomb. Jesus probably would have just said, hey, I just need to borrow it for a couple of days, right? <laughs> it's all good. But again, do you see what's happening here? What's so scandalous is if you were inventing a religion, this is not how the story should go down at all. Let me put it this way. It should say, Jesus died. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And Peter was there at the foot of the cross. And with a loud voice in front of all of the masses, he said, this man was the son of God. And people are like falling on their faces. How then shall I be saved? And then there's a group of men who are surrounding. They saw everything that if you have questions about the cross and if you want to know it's true, bring these men to court because they will give you eyewitness testimony that these things are true. And then there was a guy named James, one of the disciples of Jesus. And he boldly, passionately goes to Herod and asks, or Pilate, and asks for the body and and Pilate says, all right, gives it to him. And he makes that stand. He's willing to give his life. Like that's how the story should go down. But that isn't how the story goes down. At the death of Christ, the moment on which the hinge of history swings, who are the key players? Who are the heroes? Outsiders? Enemies? The marginalized? The oppressed? Those who are victims, centurions, women, Pharisees. This was subversive, unlikely, and shocking. The least likely people became the spearhead of what God was wanting to do in the world. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, maybe that's interesting, maybe not. When do we get out of here? Others of you are thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> There has to be something more because why would God put this in the text? Like we, we could just read, okay, Jesus died on the cross and then he rose again. Like he just skips the whole middle bit, the Saturday stuff, right? Just goes right to the resurrection. Skip to the end as they say in Princess Bride. Skip to the end, let's go. Right to, right to Sunday. You would expect that to be the case, but the fact that there's something else that's happening here tells us that there is something else happening here, that it could be that God is wanting to communicate something to us about the way that his kingdom works. And what could that be? Well, could it be that this is God's way of saying, this is how my revolution began 2,000 years ago. The liberation of women, the bringing in of the outsider, the loving of the oppressed, the serving of the marginalized. I've begun my revolution this way. And what if it's God's way of saying, that's how I will continue my revolution today? What if God is saying, the way that my kingdom will advance isn't necessarily through those that the world would say are really successful, although God can use successful people, absolutely. <laughs> but what if God could be saying, and I'm gonna take the broken, the hurt, the marginalized, the wounded, the oppressed, and they're gonna become center stage two of what I'm wanting to do in the world? What if the words of Paul that he said in 1 Corinthians, well, check it out, 1 Corinthians chapter one, he said, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were, not, when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were influential, not many of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong, he chose the lowly things of this world, the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. I wonder how many of us today, we look at that and we're like, uh, you see that verse right there? That's me. <laughs> like, that's my story. How, how many of us, well, can relate to Paul 
when he, sa- when he says God chose the foolish, he chose the weak, he chose the lowly, because I know that we've come here this afternoon and many of us are hurting. Many of us have issues from the past that to this day haunt us. Many of us right now live in the shrapnel of what people inflicted on us years ago. Maybe some of you came from a broken home and and you've had to process and deal with all of the consequences of that. Maybe some of you are in a broken marriage. Maybe some of you have, have a past of addiction, whether it's drugs or alcohol or pornography. Maybe some of you have been hurt or burned by the church. Maybe some, you've been stabbed in the back by someone. It's a victim of lies and gossip. Maybe some of you were abused, maybe even some raped. And we come here today with with hearts that are heavy and broken, and, and the lie that we so often hear the script that culture gives us, the script that we tell ourselves, what the enemy tells us is, you know what, you're not good enough. You're not worthy enough. You're not holy enough. You could never be used. God, God can never, ever use someone like you. And so what we then think is, you know what, because I'm damaged goods, because I'm messed up, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna step back and I'll let other people lead the charge. And I know in, in my life, um, this, is, this has been an issue. Um, and some of you can relate to this, where we deal with insecurity because of something that happened in the past. Um, like many of you, I didn't come from a, a Christian home. Uh, when I was eight, our family moved from England to Southern California. And shortly after we got there, things just began to unravel and fall apart. And um, my dad was an alcoholic, and there was a lot, of, a lot of drug use in the home and a lot of brokenness. And when you're 8, 9, 10, 11, when you're young like that, it's really hard to know how to process it, right? And I remember even in junior high, like teachers like worried about me and um, bringing me in for counseling, like, okay, and trying to help me process through some of the things that I was experiencing. And, and by God's grace, um, this is another story, but God later got a hold of our whole family and like rescued us. And it was pretty epic how he did that. But I would say probably well into my 20s, I really wrestled with insecurity because I would look at people who, quote unquote, God was using. And in so many cases, it seemed to be those who had great backgrounds, right? Who didn't have all the hurt and the baggage and came from pretty healthy families and supportive families. And and then I would look at my own life and think, I don't think so. It's not gonna work for me, right? I'll, I'll let other people be involved in what God's wanting to do. But man, there's too much hurt. There's too much pain. There's too many issues, I know some of you can relate to that. And and what we're learning is that Jesus is all about putting broken people back together. That, That into the mess, the shards of our life, the, the crucified Nazarene comes and says, I can heal you. I can rescue you. There are no wounds so deep that that I can't restore. There's no life that escapes the beauty of my grace. There is no story that I can't redeem. Isn't that the heart of the gospel? As Lewis says, if God's writing himself into the story, well, when he writes himself into the story of our life, he doesn't just come in as a footnote 
by virtue of his very presence, he transforms the entire story itself, where that through the gospel, he has impacted us in such a way where he says, no longer are you gonna be on the margins, you're gonna be center stage. No longer are you hurting and struggling, caught up in the past, I'm gonna restore that and use it in some way for my kingdom. Where no longer are you the rejected one, but you are the loved one as my son and as my daughter. You see, what we see in scripture is that it's the Pharisees, it's the centurions, it's the women, it's the unlikely people that God taps on the shoulder and says, join me in what I'm wanting to do in this world. And the question is, do you want to be used of the Lord? Are you willing to take what the enemy has meant for evil and to turn it around for good? Are you willing to bring to him your, your wounds and be honest about the past and give him the space to bring that healing? You know, a couple days ago when uh, I was sitting next to my daughter, Amelia, and she's scared and in a lot of pain and it was at the first hospital before they transferred us. And I'm, I'm like trying to get her mind off things and I try and give her hope or something. And um, I, I don't know if I should have done this. But I'm like, you know, honey, you're gonna have an amazing story. Like, just think about it. Like, wow, you just went through something crazy. And just imagine when you get to go to school and you get to tell your friends, wow, I broke my leg in three places and here's the x-rays of it. And it's gonna be, they're gonna be so amazed at what you went through. And she kind of listened to me and she's like, nah. She's like, I don't want a story. <laughs> she says, I just want to go home, right? And I, I can relate to that. You can relate to that, I'm sure. Like, forget the story, God. I just want to go home. Like, but what we fail to realize is that God has a way of coming into that brokenness and creating something beautiful. What we forget is that God has a way of reaching down into the most painful part of our past and saying, I can transform that. Beauty for the ashes, joy for mourning, hope for sorrow. That's who our God is. And, and it could very well be that there are some here today, you, because of what's happened, you've written yourself out of the story. You've been on the sidelines. You haven't been engaged in what God's wanting to do. And what if right now God is saying to some of you, now's the time. I'm gonna rescue you. I'm gonna use you. I'm even gonna use that mess from the past. Paul put it this way. He said in Philippians, he said, I'm forgetting what lies behind and I'm straining to what is ahead. I press towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ. Who, who wrote these words? Paul. Talk about a messed up guy, right? Blood on his hands, killed Christians, hated the Christian movement. And then you read the book of Acts and God got a hold of his life, literally knocked him off his high horse and said, Paul, I'm calling you to something different. And he wrote most of the New Testament. <laughs> Redemption, restoration, healing. And I really believe in my heart that there are some here today, you are on the cusp of being used by God in a way that you never, ever could have imagined. God's about to launch you into some kingdom project that for some, it might be something huge, where five years from now, 10 years from now, we hear about what you're done like, oh my goodness, they've been a catalyst for change, they've been fighting for injustice, they're bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. Wow, we're inspired by that story because that is God's heart and dream for your life. For others of us, it may not be some big, major thing, but it might be something simple. What I love about Mark 15 is that each of these three people, these groups that are represented, it's not like they did some massive thing. They're just simple people, ordinary people doing ordinary things. And so we have in our story, Joseph of Arimathea. Why is he a hero? Mark says, oh, he buried a body. <laughs> Maybe for some here today, the first step in your healing 
is to pull a Joseph of Arimathea. There's something you need to bury. There's some hurt and some wounds. There's some bitterness. There's some unforgiveness. And God's saying, it's time to bury that. It's time to let go of that. Forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to those things that are ahead. Maybe others here, you can relate to the women. Why are they the heroes of the story? Because, well, Mark says, they help take care of the body of Jesus. Could it be that there are some here today and the way that God is writing you into the story is that you are called to help care for the body of Christ? Maybe it's this body here at Westside. Maybe it's through missional communities and serving the city. Maybe it's what Phil and Diane have been doing the last 10 days or so, going to Uganda and serving the body of Christ. I don't know what it may look like for you, but it could be for some here, God is tapping you on the shoulder and saying, I want you to be an instrument for the body of Christ because the body of Christ is filled with hurting, wounded, neglected, struggling people, and I'm gonna use you as my hands and my feet. Maybe others, you can relate to the centurion. Why is he a hero? Because he stood there on that day and he said, hey, that guy, he's the son of God. He had boldness, courage, passion. Maybe for some, you're here and you haven't had that boldness. (laughs) Maybe you've been the quote unquote secret disciple, right? Maybe the frozen chosen, like I don't really want to talk about Jesus. I don't want to be bold for him. But maybe you know in your heart, God is calling you to a new level of boldness to share with your neighbors and your relatives and your family members and those that you work with. Hey, this is what that crucified Nazarene has done for me. He's changed me. He's been bold in reshaping my life. And I want to be bold in telling others about him. Listen, I don't know how you fit into the story, but I do know this. If you give God editing rights over the script of your life, he will shape it into something beautiful. I know that the hurts and the wounds and the pain and the brokenness and the scars, Jesus says, bring it to me. I died for that. I bled for that. You don't have to live the way you're living anymore. You don't have to carry that hurt anymore. You don't have to let the past define you. The culture around us, the enemy warring against us tells us a script which is a lie. You cannot be used by God. But what this book says and what this story says is that God's grace is enough.